Good Monday morning, and welcome to Ice Age TV, the internal combustion engine age YouTube channel that talks about all my cars and trucks and motorcycles, SUVs, the pond, the geese, the dogs, the challenges of life. Oh my gosh, what a beautiful morning, but it's cool. Breezy. Hey, good Monday morning there. Thanks for tuning in my channel. Appreciate all the support. Nice comments and great subscribers that keep me going on a daily basis. Because I uh, just have some really great interactions. So many of you out there that continue to support my channel. Which, thank you so much. On this cool, breezy Monday morning, last week of January. January's out. <laughs> Hard to believe. Again, we go into February. The February month, my birthday month, my mom's birthday. I know a lot of people that are born in February. Poor souls, right? So what are you doing now? What do you got going on now is it's rather breezy with the landmine tennis balls everywhere. Wow, look at this. I mean, that's just a project of driving around my property and picking up tennis balls. The calisthenics will, will begin. The pain, the suffering, the sacrifices, what we all do to uh, try to make things all work out and play out. So if you're watching my channel, and you see the, the Harley shirt on, but I got a Honda hat on. And I thought, what can we talk about today? Because it's always a challenge to think what would intrigue you to watch my channel, what I can talk about that may begin some information, some entertainment, and uh, and that's what I like to do. I just like to talk. That's kind of who I am. And, and once again, it's all about the new purchase, the new Harley Davidson motorcycle, the new CVO, the new Road Glide CVO, ST and I thought to myself it's the, the it's the one conversation how about the one conversation I got my other dog out there which is already a problem hey Kiever Ginger come on my name get on in pops um come on pops yeah what's the number one problem besides the dog named Kiefer uh come on Ginger let's get you upstairs for Kiefer's here up oh, here he comes <laughs> he's fast as can be he's fast so let's get him upstairs where the trouble ensues. And hey, you, 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 no. Come on, get up there. Come on. Come on, Ginger. Gotta try to maneuver. Come on, Ginger, go on. Nope. Ginger, go on. Come on. All right, come on. All right, get up there. Get up there. Come on, get up there. Stop it. Try to change up the routine. Does that do anything besides keeping me up there harassing the little girl? Uh, yeah, get that under control. We are. We were not in sound like it. Hey, Keefe boy, chill out. So, uh, so I thought to myself this morning, the good conversation could be one because what brand? What is the most famous brand that likes to put a number one on their vehicle? Well, from what I know, it's Harley Davidson. If you see the Harley Davidson brand, you'll see even like my daughter's uh, street bob she had had a big number one on it, and and that's. <laughs> And what's the point of one? Well, one usually stands for you being the winner. That you're better than the others. If you watch the uh, football over the weekend, highly debatable. <laughs> if you watch that Baltimore Ravens Chiefs game, if you're a Baltimore fan and you weren't sick to your stomach and still are sick to your stomach, I don't know how you wouldn't be sick to your stomach if you're a true Baltimore Raven fan because, boy, oh, boy, was that a game? Yeah. Yeah, was, was uh, what's-her-face, Taylor Swift, is she en route to getting not only all of her, her Grammy Awards or whatever musical awards she's received, to getting a Super Bowl award? You have to honestly say that Taylor Swift is going to have a Super Bowl ring. Yeah, when she dumps the Kelsey man, and he has to forgive that to uh, keep it all balanced in that relationship. Who knows? But the whole point is, as you all know now, in the NFC the NFC uh, versus AFC. NFC, the number one champions are the uh, Chiefs. And then if you watch the San Francisco 49ers and Lions game, at one point you would have thought that the Lions had the game, which they did. But then the second half, they fell apart. And so the 49ers are the AFC number one. They're the number one in their division. So after a long, tedious 17 regular games in the season, I believe, and then the playoffs and all the through the rounds, uh, it looks like Kansas City and the 49ers are going to have a rematch, or is it a rematch, or they're going to have a, a, a matchup. And for Mahomes, um, 
Is he going to try to be a goat? Is he going to try to outdo Bill, Bill, Tom Brady, Bill Belichick, which was part of, part of that. So, you know, the whole thing is number one. And that just seems to be the driving force of competition. Sports, business, relationships, life, education, and vehicles. And that's, that's the, the number one thing that most people, I think, all can relate with. That you want to own something that's a winner. You want to have a winner in your life, not a loser. I mean, sadly, people kind of revolve their life around the losers. But anyways, uh, here's Hoy Davidson. And you just saw on how I have a Honda hat on. Because for me, I think it's kind of, for me, I was such the Japanese rice burner kid from the 70s on Yamahas that always felt that the rice burners, the Japanese, had a far better quality product than a Harley Davidson, the AMF age. Yeah, not Audios. That is what it means. Um, so for me, I, in so many ways, I think Honda is number one. But at the other end of the spectrum here, when you go to the Harley, the natural aspirated V-twin true beginnings of the bagger bikes, I guess you could say maybe, maybe not. But the real bagger bike, um, Harley-Davidson wants to take the position that it's the number one. And who's its number one competitor? Indian. And really isn't anybody else out there in my world that's a direct competitor because then you go to the... Um, non-domestic brands. So talking the domestic, the true beginnings of the um, race to who's better from the flat tracking racing to all the racing throughout the years, it's always been Indian versus Harley-Davidson. Even though Indian came out in 1901 and Harley-Davidson came out in 1903, but it's always been the race who is number one. And Harley-Davidson has always taken great pride in putting stickers all over their paraphernalia or their motorcycles, or I should say selling paraphernalia, with a number one um, that associates the Harley-Davidson. You see stickers on cars. You see people wear the, the gear, the clothing, the hats. You see it on you know, some of the motorcycles. So, and that's what's, uh, which I kind of, I like that. I mean, I like how Harley-Davidson likes to say, hey, we're number one. But I'm sure many people will all agree, no, Harley is not number one. When it comes really to the quality, refinement, reliability, I think most will say Harley's a nice product, but for them to think that they're number one, um, well, sure, they may be number one in the bagger series of racing, but are they number one in really the quality of a motorcycle? I mean, would you take a Honda Goldwing in quality, reliability, um, versus a Harley-Davidson? And some would argue that, that Harley-Davidson's go many, many, many miles but the perception is that the American-built product, which many would now say it's not American-built anymore, Mr. Iceman. It's a Chinese-built bike. Yeah, okay. But the whole point is, I think more people would side with Honda being more of the number one reliable, better bike. And so it goes both ways. How about the Fast Johnny? I just love that. I really hated giving up my Fast Johnny motorcycle this past summer, only owned for a few months, to only get rid of it to get a brand new 23 CVO Rogue Glide, and, and so I'm so glad that they got creative on this theme of this CVO ST, which nobody knew was coming per se, because it was all under the wraps up until the big reveal day, and I just love the Fast Johnny, which that's all about the piglet that used to ride around with the winner of the flat trackers back in the day. So Fast Johnny was apparently, uh, was that the name of the piglet or was that the name of the of the racer? So, and it's and for me, I'm just not that into all the history of every little fine detail of everything. But so many people have been reaching out. This has been a big hit on my YouTube channel to uh, get a lot of exposure. A lot of people are reaching out. Majority of them all love the bike. Want to know things about it. So this motorcycle here is 25 pounds lighter than my CVO back here. And, you know, so many aspects... If I would have taken time, I would have gotten this bike out and put it next to our bike. But this motorcycle here is 25 pounds lighter. But something I didn't realize till Saturday when I was up at Frederick Harley Davidson buying a new windscreen, a new helmet, and a new uh, Bluetooth Cardo set, um, I didn't realize that the handlebars were actually different. I didn't even catch that riding that motorcycle. And I already knew what the floorboards. So if you watch my channel, it wasn't until I did 
a um, Road Glide non CVO, brand new 2024 in a parking lot of Frederick Holly Davidson. When I was walking between the two bikes, they're parked next to each other. Did I, I then realized, like, wow, this has risers and it's a whole different style handlebar. And is the handlebar actually higher? I don't think it is. I think the handlebar is using the risers just a little different, which is really cool because I really like the way those handlebars um, are. I only wish at one point I got to get my other CVO Harley, the 2021 with the 2023 and the 2024, just to have them all lined up, which should be pretty cool. It is to see all the differences between these motorcycles of what Harley Davidson has done just in the last three years, if you count model years, which is pretty incredible. And so, anyway, he's just doing the research and everything. So, apparently, the bike's 25 pounds lighter. I believe it has 121 horsepower motor, 145 foot-pounds of torque, or 147. Just so many numbers. But this CVO ST, it truly is a fun, fun motorcycle. Now, a lot of people are calling out the gaudy-looking carbon fiber. It's, I mean, that's real carbon fiber there. They think it looks, in some ways, like the, uh, you know, your... I'm trying to think of the word of the outdoor. What's the freaking word? I can't even think of the, uh, the 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 word right now. Just a total mind blank. But I'm getting you know people that reach out and, and view their views and ideas, and, and they just think in some ways it looks cheesy and gaudy. But I never have thought that any carbon fiber that I've ever seen on any car or vehicle that it looks. I mean, it just always to me it looks plastic. <laughs> it doesn't look like this metal. You know, it just doesn't, to me, I think it's neat, it's a neat appeal, but at the same time, I never have felt like the carbon fiber looking cars um, have this really high end quality look to them. It just has a different look. And for this, this is a sport bike look. And what do you do? Do you, do you make a longer fender, take that off and put, or a shorter fender? I mean, but, but why do you do that? And so here, another thing is 25 years. So Harley Davidson is saying, hey, you know, we have 25 years of the custom vehicle operations. That's what CVO means, is custom vehicle operations. And it's now in its 25th year anniversary where Harley-Davidson has dedicated uh, a team and a production to separate the Harley-Davidson uh, motorcycles from the regular one to a much more performance-oriented one, faster one. And here's the thing. So I get some people that reach out. And, and they'll be like, you know, I can just get a Road Glide. I've talked about this before. But they'll be like, you know, I can just buy a 2024 Road Glide. And I'll put a 131 motor in it. I'll do a head pipe exhaust on it. I'll do some Owens, Owens or some Showa um, rear suspension on it. Um, I'll do uh, inverted forks. I'll do some inverted forks on it. I'll change out the wheels. Um, you know, I'll change out the handlebars. Okay, all right, and so, you know, and I'll change out the floorboards, and I'll change out, the, you know, the, the hand grips, and, and blah, blah, you know, and so, sure, and you know what, what's really cool about that, that is a great project bike, and I can assure you, anybody that has the money that wants to do that, that'll be a fun adventure. Um, I'm going to change out the highway bars to the um, ST highway bars, because these highway bars are totally different from the non-ST CVO Road Glide. Uh, so, you know, if you look here, it's a totally different uh, highway bar. So, I mean, you know what? And once again, this isn't criticism. I mean, I'm with you. Badass bike. You will have truly a badass bike. You'll have a bike that will perform better than this bike because you just mod the hell out of it. But here's the thing. It's yours forever if you ever plan on getting the money out of it. Because you'll never, ever get the money out of it. And you're like, well, why? Why not? Well, yes, you will get the money out of it if you find the right individual that respects the amount of money of that $25,000 road glide that you bought, and you just put another $30,000 or $20,000 into that motorcycle. I would just say conservative, 20. <laughs> so, I mean, I would say at the end of the day, you'll be into that bike for $50,000. So, the hard facts of you being number one on your pro your number one project is modding your bike, and I can assure you, as of making this channel, it's already happening. I can guarantee you, anybody that's bought this brand new Road Glide, Street Glide, 2024, they've already ordered the 131 motor. They've already doing what I'm talking about. 
So they're going to be in, in, they may be in, if they're having somebody do all the work for them, they're going to probably be into that bike for 55 or 60. So, and that's fine. This is no criticism. It's just that for individuals saying, you know, I'm not going to pay the $43,000 plus to set up and freight and blah, 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 and be at $47,000 on this bike, this bike. Uh, like you did, Mr. Iceman, because I'm going to go a whole different right, route, and I'm going to have a batter ass bike. And I'll say, I think that's great. Okay, here's your challenge. When you go to trade the bike in, you've lost. You lost everything to a degree, not totally. If you go to sell your own, you can find somebody to pay you 50 grand, 40, 45 grand for the bike, you know, you've done well. But the challenge is, you go to the dealership, and the way the world works is it's a bank finance bike typically. Most people don't have thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars sitting around to buy something. They have to finance it. So it goes to the good old, you know, book value. The the book value, so the dealer will pull up the book value and he'll look at a twenty twenty four Rogue Glide non CVO that's been modded out. And let's just say it's now twenty twenty six. And he'll say, huh, auction prices are bringing about sixteen to seventeen thousand dollars on a motorcycle. You've got to be like, what? Yeah, okay. Uh, retail on it, high end is 20 to 21 grand. Has anybody heard these stories? I've talked about this numerous times. So that number one project you had is now the number one thorn in your ass, possibly. Because you're going to be like, no, man, no, man. I have done all these mods. All the so the dealer, a good dealer actually would say, you know what? I'll step up for you and I'll give you 22 for it. Maybe 23, maybe, maybe. You have to find the right dealer because the dealers say, maybe I'll find the right guy. And this is a huge roll of the dice that will respect all the stuff you did that bike and they can put it on the floor for 26, 27, 999. But the dealer's position is going to be, I can buy this brand new 2026 Rogue Glide, Don CVO. My cost on the back end is 18, 19 grand. And so, why do I want to pay you 22, 23 grand? For a bike that it's the what if, what guy shows up that can get qualified to buy this bike. And that's what I'm saying to you. The other says, okay, I'll give you $30,000 for your used road glide. And you'll be like, that's still too low. Well, sir, ma'am, whatever. What you don't understand is the bank's not going to buy a motorcycle that's in their books as a CV, as a non-CVO. It's a road glide bike. They're showing so just short retail high end 21 on the bike. So the guy wants to buy this bike that you want me to pay 35 grand for or 30 grand for, the guy's going to have to put down $15,000 to qualify to buy the bike. At least 10. So that's where the separation comes. And that's why the dealers always be, stay number one on when you trade something in, meaning that they're going to win and you're going to lose. And that's what many people are already, I'm sure, that are on my channel, have gone to dealership and they've taken their uh, motorcycle. In fact, I was up there at Frederick Harley, really cool guy, Paul, was at the dealership. A guy about my age, really great guy. And he was on a beautiful orange um, road glide that he's already modded. 23, it's a special. So he's into that bike for $40,000. And he's already being told by the dealership that they would maybe give him like eighteen grand for it. And some people's jaws are going to drop. And I and I said I said yeah, but I said and I, I've talked about this the other day. It's kind of a redundant conversation. But the point is, the dealer isn't going to be number two in the negotiations. Anytime you go buy something, the dealer is always going to be number one, where they're they have to make money. So if you think there's any favoritism to you. It's, it's, you won't stay in business. Dealerships have to make three three thousand dollars. Here's the reality: to a motorcycle dealership, they have to make three thousand dollars minimum these bikes to be stay in business. Motorcycle dealerships may say may may sell thirty, forty, fifty bikes in a month. Um, you know, so if they made an average of a thousand dollars per motorcycle, they're out of business. There's no way they can survive on making fifty thousand dollars. On sales, now some guys are on the other end of the spectrum that are in the dealerships can have different views and opinions, but the whole point of this is it's all about being number one, and the dealership to stay number one has to always negotiate a deal that's going to protect them from being number two. 
And the number one thing they do is they go to the auction guys, the wholesaler guys, that the worst case scenario of what they're going to get paid for that bike is what they're going to give you for their bike. Now, the running joke has been many years that car dealerships are in business to get used cars. They sell new cars to get used cars because used cars in the car market typically have bigger margins and they have more success making the profits. But what I'm hearing, this is what's really, to me, very, very interesting of what's going on more than ever. You know, I talk about this all the time on my YouTube channel. There are so many gloomer doomers, so many guys out there on these YouTube channels telling you that it's over, beyond over, your car has no value, your house. I mean, it's, it's, it's constant rhetoric. And I just have been thinking to myself lately is, are these actually guys really wanting to undermine you? Because there's one guy that's always driving around and bad-mouthing car dealerships, and he's a, he's a used car dealer. He's a used car dealer guy. He's a guy that goes to auctions, and he's constantly beating up all these car dealerships that they're losing their ass, they can't sell inventory, it's bad, 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 bad. So it's just negative content rhetoric stuff all the time. So you have to kind of stop and say to yourself, what's this guy's goal on his channel? What is he accomplishing for you? Is he making you be fearful that maybe now is a good time to sell your car? Get out of your car? Don't sell your car? I mean, what is he accomplishing? But here's the point. What I'm hearing from used car dealers is the individuals aren't giving up their used cars. Yes, did you just hear me? Many of these used car dealers' challenges, they can't find the Iceman type of um, vehicles. Most people are now holding on their vehicles because everything's gotten so expensive that people don't want those higher payments, higher costs. We, we've talked about it with the insurance. You know, there's so many things going on with the new technology of cars and making it so much more expensive. And so for the used car guys, they're, they're now picking up 80,000, 100,000, 150,000 mile used cars. That's all the market's starting to bear to them because people now have kept their cars for 10 years and they paid them off. And maybe now they have the, the savings or the, the, you know, they, or they're just at the point that they feel they can put a good amount of money down in a new car for it all makes sense. It's debatable on that. But you think to yourself, this guy that's running around running his mouth all day, is he just pissed that he can't find these used cars anymore that are low mileage cars? And, and you know, what, what, is his, what is his goal that he's trying? Is he trying to get people to get out of their cars that aren't that, um, that are have 30, 40, 50,000 miles on them? I don't know. It's just and then the, the housing market, the housing crash, you need to sell your house, and people aren't selling their houses. I mean, people are holding on to their houses. That's a whole other uh, conversation of that because what goes on more than ever in your life? If you're the normal individual, you want to be number one. I mean, I mean, if you're the normal person's world, do you want to be number one or number two? Um, I think most people want to feel like they're number one. Uh, if you go to a car dealership, motorcycle dealership, what's the biggest complaint you'll hear from people is people feel like they're not number one. They feel like they're not uh, appreciated. They feel like they've been abused. Um, that's a huge challenge for relationships on these material things that we buy in these dealerships operate and how they operate. And, and it goes from you feeling like they're taking really good care of you to then you feeling like you get crapped on. Yeah, I mean, you know, as well as I do, I shared a whole video of you of me having a whole Jeep Wrangler 392 deal done, only for at the end of the deal, the dealer is like, you ain't number one, Mr. Iceman, I'm number one, and I ain't doing the deal, because you got too good a deal. So, here's some of the stuff I bought over the weekend. I bought a new windscreen for this motorcycle, because that's my biggest complaint of these new road glides, or even the new, any Harley I've ever bought especially the more performance-oriented ones, the, the screens. This does nothing for you. So you have total wind in your face all the time. So for me, I know it's a, it's a debate of now I'm going to put on a clear screen. And here it is in here. It's a clear screen, a little smoked out. And that's going to be my, uh, my new look in the bike. And I'm sure some people will be like, ah, why are you doing that? But here's the biggest thing. One of my subscribers, Matt... Um, he's saying that he had a challenge of interfacing his, uh, his Bluetooth, uh, set. Here's your Cardo. 
in the Harley Davidson disguise in so many ways. But he was saying that the new um, Rogue Glide that he just bought, he bought a Rogue Glide, not a CVO, but he bought a really nice, uh, beautiful um, Rogue Glide. And he said that he tried to pair his headset with a bike and he couldn't get it to work. And even the dealership didn't know how to do it. So he did his research and he's saying apparently you don't go to intercom with your um, headset when you try to pair it with the, uh, the infotainment center. You have to keep it in the phone mode to pair it with the infotainment center. You know, for so many years, I've had so many bikes, not any motorcycle, and I don't think any, I think anybody here would say it's the number one problem, not only with the cars, the motorcycles, it's the constant fight to technology. Uh, it's the number one problem of these, uh, of these products, of these, you know, technology. And that Indian motorcycle that I drove back and traded in against this Harley, and another gentleman here is wanting to kind of know the numbers on that, and I'll say that in a second, but it's constant lose connectivity for your playing your music through the infotainment center. It drives you nuts. It's a constant fight. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know um, how it is on the, uh, the Harley side because in some ways, I don't want I don't want that technology in the in the bike. I'd rather just have it in my headset. I just rather have my Bluetooth capability in my headset because it just seems like you're constantly going back between your headset and then the actual infotainment center. Ah, eh, it gets complicated. I'm sure a lot of guys out there, especially older guys, are going to say this is the bike I like because the number one thing is. It has no that freaking dumbass technology in it. That's the number one thing that I hear from a lot of people is, I don't want anything to do with this. I want nothing to do with this. It's too much crap. I just want to get on my motorcycle and ride down the road and ride my motorcycle. Having all this other stuff of having to go in here and program your different rides and your navigation. But here's what's really interesting is, this doesn't have home link. So, I don't know if I showed this the other day. And my other big complaint is, on the Harley Davidson new, um, the new, the new infotainment center, the new technology is you can, you can start this bike up and the bike will run. And then when you turn it off, everything turns off. And I'm like, and so that, I don't like that. The old, the former Harley Davidson had an actual accessory power button on and then ignition to start the bike. Then you had, you could turn the motor off, but the accessories still stayed on. Um, and, we're and now they won't, cool. now, so that, the uh, technology here is everything turns off when you hit this button. It's just stupidest thing in the world. So on the ST, you don't get the home link. See here? No home link. Can't get into it. So you got to buy a module, which that sucks. What's that up there? Is that Apple Play? Is that something I have to put a module in as well? I don't know. I'm not sure on that. So, but here's the thing. So, the bike's running. I turn it off. And the reason that is the worst on a motorcycle, because you, when you pair all your technology to this bike, and you want to pull over to get gas, or you just want to pull off the side of the road for a second, it's so much nicer to leave all the electronics on without turning off the bike. So, one gentleman said, well, you're wrong on that. This motorcycle has a capability for you to power it on with this little accessory button. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, I didn't know that. And so I was like, that's, that's good information. So let me see if I can hold it down here. If you have to hold it down or what you have to do here. I think you have to hold it down for a second. So, okay, so there it is. So I just powered that on. That's great. That's fantastic information. But here's the ball game. When I go over here and I start the motorcycle... And I want to now just uh, pull off the side of the road and turn the engine off and keep the technology on. You have no choice to hit this little button and the whole bike turns off. So this does nothing. This does nothing more than what this does. I get no idea why they even have that there. That's just stupid. So for Harley, huge mistake in my eyes of not having the accessory to continue to let your vehicle stay on because of the number one problem with these, these motorcycles and these cars is the interfacing of your technology. And that's why General Motors is taking position. They're done with these Apple phones and Android phones. They no longer, from GM's 
production point on are going to support your phone interfacing with CarPlay or Android Play in the infotainment centers of any GM vehicle. They're taking it away. And I can kind of understand that because there's so many times you drive down the road and you're so distracted fighting with the technology to, to get that to, entertain, to populate onto your infotainment center as you're being distracted going down the road. It's a huge distraction. It's really bad. So <clears throat> we're at the 30-minute mark. Do I keep on talking? Or do I keep, do I keep the, uh, <coughs> my, my throat needs some water here, so sorry for the coughing, hacking, but I'm talking and hacking and cough, coughing. So the, uh, the, the deal, so I just kind of go to that. That way, one gentleman asked me, he said, what, what were the numbers? So pitifully, you know, sadly, the, uh, I've got to get some water in my throat. It's all dried out for my coffee. Sorry. So the Indian motorcycle, it, it's a typical story. I mean, you go out and buy anything brand new, and what do you think the value of the thing is? I mean, anybody thinks you're going to buy something from a car dealership, motorcycle dealership, you're going to keep it, take pristine condition of it, and then you're going to trade it in, and it's going to be so great, so much money. You know, you're not. It doesn't work that way. The only reason new car dealerships are in business, new motorcycle dealerships are in business, because they have margins on cars, and there'll always be the loss of value of whatever you buy, because that's the way the world works. They wouldn't be in business you, they couldn't stay in business if your motorcycle or car was always worth more than what they could sell as new. We had a little time of that with the pandemic of the shortage of cars, but that was just a very unique situation. So as far as the deal on this bike, which I went back and forth trying to sell my Indian um, Challenger Elite, and I had that thing up for sale for about a year, and I had some good numbers brought to table, and... And I had one guy up to like thirty thousand dollars, thirty one grand. That's swerping down. He's gonna show up at my my place and buy the bike. That was last summer. But everybody else would say they wanted to buy the bike, but they couldn't afford the bike. That's the story. They wanted the bike, but couldn't afford the bike. Well, they couldn't get a loan. So at the end of the day, I gave up that bike at twenty three thousand dollars. It's a thirty six thousand dollar motorcycle. I think it was. I think this bike was like thirty four nine ninety nine or thirty six nine ninety nine. But then you have the tax and tags. You know, you're at forty grand by the time it's all said and done. So, anyways, I gave up that bike for twenty three grand, but I still owed eighty eight hundred dollars on that motorcycle. So, Freedom Road Financial presently now has with me my Triumph financed, my Indian FCR financed, and I had the Challenger Elite financed. So they have an exposure with me, and they have a limit and cap. So, with me basically putting twenty grand down between my motorcycle's value and me putting some cash down. I put twenty grand down towards this forty-seven thousand dollar motorcycle, which it basically, you know, got it down to. Uh, well, at the end of the day, it came down to I financed like thirty thousand dollars. I think that was the actual uh, number. So maybe it was like seventeen or eighteen grand to be kind of exact on numbers. So for the gentleman that, that reached out, he was asking, "What were the numbers?" Well, there's the numbers: twenty-three thousand um, dollar value. I had like fourteen grand of uh, equity to, towards the bike. Then I put down like another $3,500 to make it like eighteen five or something. And then of course the dealership, which I gave it to them, they want to do the extended warranty and the wheel and tire. And just to appease the finance person, I bought that. I didn't buy the gap. And so here's a bike that I got for 60. I, I took the 60 month uh, payment structure instead of 72 because I got the 9.99 financing, but at the end of the day, this is like a $690 a month payment for 60 months in this motorcycle. So it's not cheap. It's not cheap to go out and buy these toys. And what's so aggravating as I get older, it's one thing when the bike's $43,000. But then you pay the tax man. The tax man, if you think about how much money, I've talked about this before. If you think about how much money I have given to the tax man and sales tax, I can guarantee you I have outdone every single person. Every single person. And, and there's nobody who can tell me it's bought 500 vehicles in their lifetime. So if you think about the contribution of all the taxes, I mean, it's just, ah, it's sickening. Because what happens is that $40,000 motorcycle you go buy, when it's all said and done, they're going to charge administration fee. They're going to want the freaking, some dealerships do it, some don't. This is a hot item. If I want to sit it out, and wait for Chesapeake Harley to get this bike in, they're not going to charge me to set up and freight. Here's a challenge. 
They don't have Freedom Road. They don't have Freedom Road Financial. And some and anybody else on my channel I know are going to say you really should have traded this CVO Rogue Glide for that bike. And I've talked about it. It's a redundant conversation, but not everybody hears everything because some people watch some videos, some don't. But here's the challenge. I just traded two bikes for this bike, which was even negative equity, even money down. I owe like forty-five thousand dollars on this bike. So for Holiday Financial, this is huge. This is a huge nut, huge obligation. What's the value of the bike? Oh, it's pitiful. I guarantee you, I'll fight for thirty-five grand. I guarantee it. Ten grand, ten grand upside down. So this is now just a bike that I'll ride and I'll enjoy. And I'll just pay on, and we'll have to keep it a good year, at least, probably. One day, will it go to go somewhere else? Possible. Will I trade it for a different ride? Probably. But meanwhile, somebody in my channel and so many others are saying, you should trade that. I can't. I can't. I, because it would be huge monies out of my pocket. They'd be like, well, take your, your Indian Challenger and, and then trade that with that. Yeah, well, but it's still at the end of the day. To me, it's like, but I'm giving up the Indian Challenger just to cover all that bad debt. I don't want to do that. I'd rather have equity in this bike down here, and I'm and I'm and Harley Davidson Financial. For the record, they're not being nice. They're getting killed. I guess they're just not giving good rates. Harley Davidson Financial. If you watch my channel, they're wanting 23, 24 percent, you know, rates on uh, financing. Uh, that bike there is huge financing debt right there. That that there same freaking story. Yeah, my wild man, I'm crazy. But hey, what's the number one thing I like to do? I like to buy something. What's the number one thing I love? Cars, trucks, motorcycles. That's the number one thing that I really uh, enjoy. So for a gentleman out there, ask him about the bike. So the guy that's really smart, you're going to be patient. You'll wait for um, a dealer that, that doesn't charge set up and freight. And, or you'll negotiate to set up and freight. And you'll wait and be patient, and this bike will come in a dealer. Frederick Harley still had one there on Saturday. I don't know about yesterday. I doubt yesterday. It rained, downpour rain all day. Can't see selling yesterday, but Frederick Harley has one of these. I don't know if they're trying to get anything above MSRP. I have no idea. So people are checking it out, looking at it. It's a lot of money. But point is, if you play it smart, you have no trade. Um, you've got good amount of money to put down this bike. And if you're really smart, you buy it and you don't sell it. <laughs> you keep it. You keep the damn thing. And that's what many people are saying to me is like, don't get rid of this bike. Now, yeah, I hear you. I don't disagree. It's a cool bike. Um, I, you know, for me, can I keep anything? It usually doesn't last. Who knows? Maybe this will be different. Who knows? Will this really be a low production bike? Um, I doubt it. I'm, I'd be imagine that, you know, Harley Davidson wants to make their money. And to make their money, they got to sell motorcycles. And to make motorcycles, why would they really care at the end of the day for them, whether it's just a specially built bike or everybody has them? You know what I wanted to show you? I'm, I'm forgetting here. i got to get my phone open. But it is a picture of what I wanted so many years ago. I don't know if this will populate here or not. Okay, so there, look at this bike right here. That bike, back in 2014, BMW teased me and all the BMW people, of the future K1600 bagger bike. And when I saw that picture, I was like, I want that bike. That is a badass bike. I'm so disappointed that Indian did not, I mean, Indian, BMW, yeah, Indian's still stuck in my head, right? Indian did not, I mean, BMW did not um, build this bike. Why? They did build the bagger bike. But let me show you something. You know, in so many ways, you know, I sometimes wonder, to the guy that, uh, you know, kind of went to the new design on this bike, you know, did he try to kind of, you know, give you the the BMW bagger bike look? I mean, come on. Hey, on my channel, is that a badass looking bike? Why why didn't BMW, buy, you know, build that? Because remember, I, if you're watching my channel, I brought home a BMW K1600 bagger, which that was the renderings for that bike was supposed to be. I'm out embellishing here. That's the facts. So, but for me, I rode that bike in the back end dances. It's a really cool bike. It's a BMW. But at the end of the day, um, if I would have gone that direction, and I would have had to give something up. But anyways, here it is. It's a long video. Leave it at that. I was just, I'm just dedicating the number one um, thing right now on my channel is this. This is the number one thing that's getting a lot of attention, and it's really cool. 
and it really is a nice bike and it really is different and it really is nimble and i really like the short um the short floorboards i like the way the bike feels but for me all my cvo's i always get the tailbone eventually over many miles in the the bottom of my tuchus eventually i start to kind of feel and i put 84 miles on this so it's gonna be interesting for me to get a good 150 200 mile a day one guy's like you're not a rider dude you should take that bike and ride it 3,500 miles over this next weekend to really find out what the bike is. I'm like, yeah, I'm not the iron butt guy. Yeah, Hey, if you're that type of person, God bless you. Have a great time. Go have fun. That ain't me. I'm not into the ride a motorcycle for the pain factor. And there's no way you can tell me that if you go ride 3,500 miles over the weekend, where you're talking going uh, basically 1,700 miles, um, just, you know, you're, you'd have to ride three, four days You'd be riding 1,000-mile days for at least three days. I just can't see that being very enjoyable. You know how many times you're going to pull off to get fuel? You only go, like, what, 200 miles? I mean, you have to be looking for a gas station hundred miles. I, I just don't see how that's really enjoyable. I buy my bikes to enjoy the back roads and just to, to have fun and, uh, and don't have to have a prerequisite where I have to go do something to have fun with my bike. So, anyways, there it is. As always, as always, I'll clear everybody's... Uh, time and in the, i appreciate the commitment of others that watch my channel they really do it's a commitment just like me but if you actually take the time you say to listen to me talk and you know what's so cool one of my subscribers actually reached out and said wow it's sunday and i didn't hear the ice man's good morning conversation he was bumming i was like wow that was so nice of that guy to say that like that's pretty powerful i guess that's what keeps it going because uh it's very uh, to, if you really think somebody out there is going to go out and make a, a living doing this, you don't. <laughs> I wish I could tell you you did. I mean, I sincerely, I would not lie to anybody here. If I was making tons of money doing this, I would say, yeah, man, it's a great operation, great deal. But uh, it's more about your passion. I'm just wanting to uh, share your life's adventures. And if that's what it's about, then I think you'd be all right. So there it is. Where's the Whipple Supercharger? I'm sure that thing's not far away from coming in. But sadly, my dealer, which one of my favorite guys in the back end, may not be at that dealership anymore. That is so disappointing. Wow. So I don't know. That's, that's a little nerve-wracking. But I think it'll make it all work. But anyway, so that's the next big, 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 you know, what is the next adventure? I don't know. If you watch my channel, do I pick up an F450? Yeah, I mean, that's enticing, right? So let's leave it at that. I'll talk all day. Hey, God bless. Stay safe. Have a great day. And stay tuned for more adventures.